I consider this to be a defining moral failure for the Labour Party. And I will, I don't think, be able to forgive the politicians that are behind it. So I'm delighted to be joined by Grace Blakely. She is an uh, economics commentator and an author. She's published very widely and she's the author of three books. Her most recent is Vulture Capitalism, Corporate Crimes, Backdoor Bailouts and The Death of Freedom. Hello, Grace. Hello, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Let's dive straight into the book. Your thesis, as I understand it, is that not just that capitalism is failing for us, but that capital capitalism is failing even on its own terms as advocated by fans of capitalism. Flesh that out for us a little bit. Yeah, so I think, you know, the standard divide when it comes to talking about, about capitalism uh, seems to be there are those on, broadly speaking, the right who say that, you know, free markets basically work and we need kind of minimal regulation from the state in order to kind of supervise those markets. And then there are those on the left who say uh, free markets don't work and we need government intervention to make markets work. And that's mm -hmm. been the kind of standard divide within like political economy, basically a divide between, uh, you know, J.M. Keynes, who was uh, an economist writing in um, kind of the early 20th century and Hayek, um, who was writing a little bit later, who's the kind of darling of the like neoliberal movement. Um, and I'm basically arguing in this book that that divide conceals the way that capitalism actually works, basically. Um, because if you look at um, the kind of economy that we have, it's based on this kind of toxic fusion of public and private power in the interests of those at the very top. There was some news today, more news about Boeing, um, the whistleblower who... Um, called out the company for the failings that led up to the 737 MAX disasters has just been found dead. Um, and that comes on the back of the, the disasters mm. themselves that took place two years ago and other kind of, you know, big engineering failings like this, uh, the door blowing out of the plane mid-flight. Um, and if you look at Boeing, this kind of illustrates my point quite neatly, and I talk about it a bit in the book, because, uh, you know, this is this massive aerospace company that has very little competition. It's, it, you know, Boeing and Airbus, the two big aerospace companies. Um, it developed these planes knowing, basically, that there was this kind of shoddy engineering that would potentially lead to fatalities. Um, the uh, executives cleared the plane to go, um, to go to market anyway, and have now been charged with a criminal conspiracy to to defraud um, the government over that. Uh, so it kind of seems like that's just a, a standard failure of the free market, right? But then you look a little deeper and you see that the FAA, for example, failed to regulate the company because it was um, being regulated by a unit that sat within Boeing and whose employees were being paid by Boeing. This was this philosophy of self-regulation. And that Boeing had been a massive recipient of corporate welfare and was kind of intimately involved with the US's military industrial complex. So the idea that we can kind of fix markets or fix capitalism by getting governments to clean up after companies like Boeing, or indeed that we could subject these companies to any real competition, uh, is kind of for the birds. Um, I argue that actually what we need to do is decentralise power. OK, but I mean, uh, talk me through the... I'm not going to say the, the jump there, but the process there, where you go from being capitalism is failing, clearly this is why it is failing, to not we must then fix it, but no, we need to have something else entirely instead. Because that, if nothing else, sounds like a lot more work. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's work that I do in the book, but I'll try and kind of lay it out for you now. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you lay out that argument, you'll often get people saying, particularly libertarians, like, oh, that's not real capitalism, that's mm -hmm. crony capitalism, right? So it's a kind of perversion of um, an otherwise well-functioning free market system. And my argument, which is a historical argument, it goes back, you know, um, all the way really to the origins of capitalism. I look at, for example, the emergence of the East India Company, um, which was integral to the development of, of commercial capitalism and sure. also to the British Empire. Um, and that is obviously based on Adam Smith, actually, who's kind of the founder of, uh, well, you know, the father of, of thinking on, on capitalist political economy, free market political economy. Uh, he calls the East India Company a strange absurdity because he says it's, um, you know, a, a, a corporation in the guise of a state um, and that that kind of contravenes the basic principles of political economy as he is then elaborating them, which is based on this divide between politics and economics, between markets and states. But then you look at the way the capitalism developed mm. and you see this deep integration between states and markets and you realise, oh no, this isn't crony capitalism. It's not cronyistic for governments to bail out corporations or for corporations to be kind of lobbying governments to bend them to their will. That is and has always been the very foundations of how the system has developed and we would not have the kind of economy, the kind of world that we have today, were it not 
for that system. So if we don't have that kind of break on corporate power that is alleged that we do have by actually, you know, people across the political spectrum, even the kind of free marketeers say some government regulation is needed, for example, to kind of enforce competition. But if that break doesn't really exist, because basically, state policy is influenced by the balance of power within society, and in a capitalist society, power is held by basically capitalists, then, you know, the system is broken, and there's basically no fixing it. Mm. So either you accept you know, the system as it is now with all of the kind of, you know, deep inequalities, climate breakdown, all the corporate scandals that I lay out in the book, which I think most people will find really, really abhorrent. Or you say this thing needs to be changed quite fundamentally. For, um, I mean, away from the theory for for people, for the and, uh, and not even for all people, because obviously when we get into colonialism in the East, East India Company, there's a, a lot of people who don't factor in this equation. Mm. But say for, for British people in a capitalist society, a lot of people would believe perhaps uh, something has gone wrong recently. Mm. For your generation, yes. clearly, capitalism isn't working. Mm. For perhaps my parents' generation, maybe it worked quite nicely. What would you What would you say to that? Um, I'm very glad you you brought that up because it again al aligns with a big argument that I make in the book. So the argument is that kind of what I call capitalist planning. So that is this kind of fusion between public and private interests um, to override the diktats of the market mechanism mm -hmm. basically has been a constant feature of capitalism from its inception but the nature of that planning has changed based on and this is where the marxist analysis comes in the balance of class power within society right. so when workers have been you know very well organized they've been able to say demand higher wages which has led to a more equal balance between workers and bosses and um, when it comes to the wage share of national income they've been able to organize within the state and make demands of the state and that was obviously the foundation of Keynesianism and the post-war consensus. And the example I look at here is um, actually the example of Ford. So this is a company that has existed for a very, very long time. Um, its origins uh, lie in the kind of laissez-faire free market period around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and uh, it kind of developed into this big monopoly, had a huge amount of power. Ford was really aggressive to try and stop workers organizing in the company. But then as the Second World War um, progressed and organized labor became slightly more powerful then that obviously became uh, much more established in the post-war period there was no real way that ford could you know completely uh, push back the threat of organized labor so he had to allow uh, his workers to organize um, and that then kind of transformed the way that the company had worked previously ford had been and there's some fascinating examples of the kind of planning that um, the ford motor company undertook over the lives of its workers it was things like their um, workers wives weren't allowed to work outside the home they weren't allowed to drink. Um, Ford even tried to set up a rubber plantation, a private rubber plantation in, in the Amazon, um, in Brazil, uh, to kind of build this massive corporate empire. But that his power was um, checked after the Second World War by the strength of the labor movement, the, the UAW in particular. And you see this across the whole economy, basically, that previously kind of corporations that basically were able to have huge sovereignty effectively um, over the lives of their workers, over the operation of society, suddenly found in the post-war period that they had less freedom to act or the executives had less freedom to act because of the counterweight that was placed on them by organized labor. Now, what changed in the 1980s? It was a full frontal attack on the power of workers and a removal of the restrictions that had previously existed on, um, you know, finance, on uh, like certain areas of, of corporate governance um, that allowed... Uh, basically kind of, you know, reverse that shift that mm -hmm. we've seen in the post-war period to to put more power back in the hands of, of bosses, basically. Um, and that's kind of what I argue that shift has come from. It's basically been, um, you know, the, a move from a, less e from a more equal society to a less equal society that's come from not a shift in ideas necessarily, although that has come alongside it, and not just a change in policies or, you know, a sudden decision amongst our political classes to do things differently, but it's come from a change in the balance of class power. And that's kind of the foundation of my argument as to where we need to go next. If we want a fairer society, we need to redistribute power. Okay, but um, from what you're saying then, there was there was a time when capitalism did work better because it was checked. Yes. By, because it was checked by, as you say, a, a, differently, a different distribution of class power. Um, why does that not, why does that not lead you towards believing we should rescue it? Why do we need to trash it? Well, it's an interesting question, and I kind of go into this a bit in the book um, about what happened during that post-war period to kind of give rise to the neoliberal, um, uh, the neoliberal kind of you know pushback, I suppose. 
And there are um, dynamics within the economy which suggest that the way that that system worked wasn't necessarily sustainable um, over the long run, um, particularly to do with kind of, you know, the way in which it relied on global dynamics that no longer that no longer prevail. But the most important thing, I think, is the political foundations of that system were always very shaky. There was basically this kind of, um, you know, concordat between capital and labor that was supervised by the state. And it was based on the fact that the economy was growing quite a lot in, in the global north, obviously, in the rich world. Um, and so workers in the rich world were able to kind of compromise with bosses at that time to say, we'll, um, you know, share the proceeds of this growth relative more equally between the two of us. The reason that that broke down in the 1970s was because you obviously had that crisis of stagflation. When the, you know, the, the um, growth that you saw during the post-war period started to slow, there was a much more tense battle over the reduced proceeds of growth. And that brought that latent political conflict between workers and bosses that had been kind of rumbling under the surface, but had been basically kind of um, smoothed over mm -hmm. through social democracy. It brought that out to the fore. That's why you see everything happening, um, you know, the massive kind of labor disruptions that you see happening in the 1970s. Um, and, you know, my argument and the Marxist argument was that that inherent tension between bosses and workers is only something that can be you know, as I said, kind of smoothed over for a small period using various different political fixes. So that was the post-war period. After that, you had the housing bubble, um, which, you know, allowed lots more people to get, get on the property ladder. It created huge capital gains that made people feel a lot wealthier. You had pensions privatization again that created this new kind of, you know, neoliberal way of viewing the world where you're an asset owner and an individual entrepreneur. And for a while, that again made the system seem stable because it covered over that contradiction between um, workers and bosses. But again, that broke down. And as soon as that broke down, suddenly we get that conflict re-emerging um, in the form of, you know, different kinds of politics, mm. uh, like the rise of the far right, as well as um, policies like austerity. So again, you know, this is a Marxist analysis, and I'm, I'm not kind of shy about putting that forward. Mm. It is this idea that there is no real way to completely remove that, that conflict between the people who own everything that we need to survive and those who have to sell their labor for a living. I'm interested in knowing whether you see a, a villain here, right? Because you, you quote in the book, you, you quote Hayek in the book. You yeah. mentioned Hayek before. You quote him quite a lot in the book. Yeah. But you uh, the quote I, I pulled out was um, where he says, the cognitive capacity of the masses was trivial compared with the intellectual influence of the elites. Now, for one thing, that's look, that's obviously rude about the masses. But I've always thought it's it's just sort of incredibly flattering to the elites. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, um, you know, I mean, I, it's very kind. I've, I've met these people. They're not mm. up to it. I'm interested in whether you see... The, the neoliberalism you talk about, the, uh, the sort of uh, runaway capitalism, the, the, the vulture capitalism we're talking about, whether somebody's doing that on purpose or whether this is just the inevitable grinding breakdown of systems. So my answer, I think, is often quite disappointing to people who want there to be a villain. Um, and I often find myself having to illustrate what are quite theoretical arguments with stories that mm. include examples of people objectively behaving very badly. You know, there's Boeing. I look at ExxonMobil, WeWork, a lot of examples in the book of real kind of villainous behavior. But for me, the problem is not individuals. Um, there's a quote in the book that um, comes from, I think it's Ursula von der Leyen saying, or maybe no, Christine Lagarde, sorry, um, saying if it had been Lehman sisters instead of Lehman brothers, we never would have had the financial crisis. And I find this argument that if you kind of change the identities of the people at the top um, or make them somehow less villainous, that uh, things would fundamentally shift. I think that's wrong. Um, I think the reason that, as you say, you know, Hayek had this belief about the, um, the you know, brilliance of, of the elites, mm. which is obviously, you know, looking at our democracy yeah. pretty, <laughs> pretty yeah. ungrounded, yeah. exactly. I actually think that that kind of way of thinking stems from... Um, unequal and hierarchical societies. It's a kind of post hoc justification. It's mm -hmm. like if there are already imbalances of power, um, and those imbalances of power, are of course, sustained by an unequal education system, etc., then you have to believe that the people at the top are somehow more competent than everyone else. Otherwise, the legitimacy of the system would be called into question. So actually, for me, and like a big part of why I wanted to write this book was to challenge that idea that I think a lot of people hold, that there is this big difference between the intellectual capacity of the masses and that of elites. Um, and the example I look at of the Lucas plan, where workers basically delivered this plan to kind of take over the company within which they worked, and everyone was like, oh my God, how could they do this? This is actually really good. It kind of shows that we do have the capacity to govern ourselves. 
Okay, well, I mean, that, so that, that actually leads me on nicely to my, to my next question, because many would say, even if your analysis is, is entirely correct, um, tearing up systems is difficult, it's stressful, it's painful, it's quite frightening. Mm. Um, perhaps the best we can do is indeed tinker. Perhaps, the, perhaps the, the, the sort of slightly cowardly centrist pragmatist argument that goes, okay, even allowing all these problems are entirely real, perhaps really the realistic thing to do is to make things slightly better wherever we can. Uh, I guess the first thing I'd ask is just what you think of that argument, both on a sort of a, both a practical and a moral level. I think on a practical level, there's some overlap with, with what I'm saying, because I'm not saying, you know, we need a revolution. I think my book was reviewed by Socialist Worker the other day, and they were very disappointed that I didn't advocate for full-scale socialist revolution. Right. Um, but I am saying, you know, we need... Um, we need basically to shift the balance of power in society. And that comes from a lot of different mechanisms. So you can look at that in terms of policy changes that come from central government to democratize the state, to democratize the way that businesses work, give workers voice, etc. Or, and I think this is actually more relevant and more important now, given that kind of most major political parties would never even dream of doing any of those things. It's looking at how people can build community power, worker power from the ground up, from the grassroots. So the things that I'm most excited about looking at our politics today are things like the community wealth building agenda. Um, so things like Preston Local Council, um, d like saying we're going to move away from this kind of extractivist, outsourcing, capita-led model of, of local economics and say we're going to sponsor the development of cooperatives, build up community banking, try and develop community land trusts and engage local people in decisions about their mm. local area. The other one that I looked at was this little village called Blyneau Festiniog in North Wales, where that had actually come from the community itself. Local people setting up community enterprises, setting up a community-owned energy energy company to help people deal with the cost of living crisis and just really building out this um just sense of, of community and solidarity that i think we've lost as we've moved to this highly individualistic way of understanding ourselves and society um and you know there are big objective transformations in economics and politics that you can look at that would undoubtedly change things. But for me, if that's ever going to happen, the first step has to be a shift in the way that we view ourselves and our relationships to one another, um, rather than seeing ourselves as these kind of isolated, atomized mm. individuals who are all kind of competing against one another in allegedly free markets that aren't actually free. We need to start thinking about how we can work together to try and change the systems that we all work and live in. Yeah, I mean, individualism and the problems with individualism are, of course, a, a big theme in the book. Yeah. There's a, from, from when we're talking about grassroots power, unionized power, all that sort of thing, there is a sort of Tory pessimist view, not even mm. just a Tory pessimist view, an, an Orwellian pessimist yeah. view as well, uh, much sort of trotted out in the, in the battles against the unions in the 80s, that when you have union power, all you really have is a different class of bosses. Yeah. All you really have, you have union strongmen that, that, that they end up being not terribly representative of the people they're representing. And the same can be true of community groups. They end up being mm. led by demagogues. They end up being anti-democratic. Uh, uh, and they end up just being a sort of, a, a, yes, a different sort of power structure, mm. but not necessarily a better or more free one. What? Do, how would you respond to that? I find this argument really interesting. My granddad was actually, he was a communist and he was a shop steward in the TGWU. And I remember him saying, making this argument all the time that the union that he was working in had become too bureaucratic, it had basically become kind of co-opted mm. um, by, you know, both the business and actually, you know, you can see this process of co-option taking place with the Labour Party and the British state, actually, with the unions in the post-war period. And a lot of people become really kind of disillusioned by that because, you know, there's this promise that lies at the heart of socialism, basically, that is like about freedom and autonomy mm -hmm. and about respecting the dignity of the human being. And I think a lot of people saw what happened in the post-war period as a kind of betrayal of that vision. And I don't think that's entirely wrong. You know, there were, like social democracy, obviously, in my view, gave us a better society than the kind of neoliberal version that we have today. But there were huge um, flaws in it that ultimately were partly why it collapsed. It didn't have this place for self-government, for respecting human freedom and, and, and autonomy. Um, and there were these kind of big kind of bureaucratic institutions that dominated um, individuals and kind of didn't allow for like individuals to mm. flourish, I guess. So that's why I, I think actually today, um, 
I, I don't think that could happen again, right? Because we've gone so far down the route of like individualism, individual self-expression, identity. You know, these issues aren't going away. There's no way that you can imagine people's individual identities being kind of crushed by so this. You, so you've got a plus from individualism power. there, right? Yeah, I do yeah, actually. No, yeah. I think, I'm. you know, as a Marxist, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm into dialectics. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of idea that uh, you get two opposing forces and they interact and then they produce something slightly different. This actually goes back to Hegel. Galen, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, thesis, antithesis, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I do think that, you know, it's almost like individualism was kind of the inevitable result of the collectivism that took place in, um, in the post-war period. And actually what the neoliberals did really successfully was draw on the critique that had emerged out of, out of the kind of 68 movement, for mm. example, the critique of the post-war um, compromise and then kind of, um, you know, use that to, to carve up a new coalition. So, yeah, you know, I think, I don't, I'm not saying let's go back to the 60s, yeah, sure. right? That's not what I'm saying at all. And the thing I say in the book is like, we need a new view of freedom. What I, it's not even actually a new view of freedom. I would say it's the original Marxist socialist view of freedom, which is about respecting the dignity and autonomy of the human being whilst giving us as individuals and groups the collective power to make decisions over the most important kind of institutions mm -hmm. um, that affect our lives. Because at the moment, we have lots of allegedly individual freedom. You're free to kind of go and buy whatever you want and, you know, allegedly work wherever you want, although that freedom is highly limited by the fact that you need to eat and put food on the table. But we don't have any control over, you know, the way that we're governed, the way our companies work, things like the direction of innovation, like whether or not we're going to be able to push back against climate breakdown because these systems are so... Uh, remote from people's lives. So I'm saying freedom is both of these things. It's the ability to make decisions about yourself, but also the ability to influence the direction of collective institutions. Mm. We'll come back to environmentalism particularly yeah. in a minute, because I'm very interested in, in various aspects of what you'd have to say about that. But first, I wanted to move away from the book slightly, ask you about Labour. <laughs> Where are you with Labour at the moment? Where are you with, the <laughs> Keir, with, with Keir Starmer's Labour? I don't think that you would be particularly surprised to know that I am somewhat miffed with mm -hmm. the direction of the Labour Party. Um, although I have to say, not surprised. You know, a lot of the um, Marxist theorists that I quote in the book have very dim views of the Labour Party, most notably Marxist theorist Ralph Miliband, otherwise known right. as the yep. father of, uh, of the, mm -hmm. the Miliband brothers, um, who was very pessimistic about the possibility of the Labour Party delivering any kind of radical change in this country. Um, and again, I think the problem is basically the fact that... Um, we've seen this shift away from the attempt to recreate Labour as a mass party with a kind of broad base and back to the, like, cartelized political do you mean, parties. Of do you the, mean a move away from what Jeremy Corbyn was doing? Yeah, so a move away from, right. like, democratic structures within the party. And yet Keir Starmer's probably going to win and Jeremy Corbyn didn't. I mean, is that... Is that sure, but I mean... How, how, how... I guess that's part of a bigger question that I'd ask you, which is how... How important is it to you that this stuff is practical? <laughs> it is very right? important to me. I mean, that's why I spend the whole, like a big part of the book. I spend the whole third section of the book saying, look at these things that are yeah. happening right now in your communities all over the world. People are already doing this stuff. It's not outside of the realms of possibility for it to happen here. Um, I guess, you know, the, the issue for me is that Starmerism is framed in terms of practicality, yes, right? Sure. Whereas for me, knowing the Labour Party as I do, I see it... Uh, I see that basically as a guise, that uh, as a, a kind of cover-up for what is really a reassertion of the authority of a certain group of people at the centre of the Labour Party. Um, and actually, you know, who, when they come into power, will view their role as a reassertion of the authority of the state and of, like, you know, vested interests over people's mm. lives. Whereas what was really threatening, I think, about Corbynism was the fact that it was about trying to give people a voice in the governance of a political party and then eventually the governance of all of our lives. Actually, the one thing, um, there was a, an interview with Tony Blair where he said the thing that most angered him about Corbynism was the fact that members had a voice in the policymaking process. And this was something that Blairism really aimed to fight back against. It was about sidelining the unions, sidelining mm -hmm. members in actually developing and implementing policy. Um, and, you know, you can make lots of criticisms about 
the idea that members would be entirely in control of the policy making process that's not what i'm saying what i am saying is when you have the kinds of political parties we have today that have there are these political scientists in the 90s they called them they, they looked at the cartelization of our political parties they basically become cartels mm. so they uh, imitate one another and then rather than getting their energy and their resources from a mass base they shut off the mass base and try and kind of basically suck resources out of the state so it just becomes this merry-go-round that we are very familiar with now where you know parties change but the basic, you know, structures of the economy and everything else stays the same. And if you want to change that, you need some form of democracy within the party. You need ways for ordinary people to be able to communicate with and through their representatives to say, we want things to change. I guess the fear among, uh, if not Blair, then certainly Blairites, was that when you have that kind of mass democracy in the Labour Party, it becomes unelectable. Because because you have the because because the people who are most likely to drive it are likely to be less, not more, uh, like the public at large, right? That was the argument, yeah. and I would say that the policies that emerged out of say, you know, the twenty seventeen manifesto, right, mm -hmm. which were like super popular with most of the the members of the Labour Party, were actually also very popular with the country. But they didn't now, vote for them. Well, in 2017, a lot of people voted for that. It's, and that was, you know, yeah, in the, in the context of a... I mean, famously, not enough. Well, not, <laughs> you know, not enough people, yeah, sure. Yeah. But it was a very high share of the vote, wasn't it? It was something like 40... It was, it was, a, it was, a, high share. It was very, yeah, a relatively high share of the you vote. You know, yeah. if that... Um, if Labour had got that vote share now with mm. a Tory party that's basically completely defunct, then they would be in government with that that manifesto. You know, you can't abstract from the particular political... That's, I mean, sorry, this, this is a, it's a, a cheap political question but does that mean you think if jeremy corbyn was still the leader of the labor party then he would be on course to being elected no of course not right. yeah there was a reason that corbyn was uh was removed from power that had to do with both kind of flaws and problems within the movement mm -hmm. around him itself and also obviously this very concerted attack that had a long time to develop you know corbyn was leader of the labor party for quite some yeah. time it meant that there was a long period of time to kind of take him down um, but again those of us who were involved with that movement it wasn't it was presented as this kind of like you know um there was like hagiographies of jeremy corbyn and he was like the savior of everyone but po the reason poetry there was poetry yeah, well, there was poetry yeah. the reason that most of us got involved with that movement was nothing to do with jeremy corbyn you know there was a group yeah. of socialist mps each of whom took it upon themselves to stand at one election this time it happened to be mm -hmm. corbyn it could have been mcdonnell yeah. could have been anyone really history but, could have been very exactly yeah. um but you know we were involved in that because we were excited about the reinvention of Labour as a mass party. And I just, you know, this argument about electability, right? Let's go back to the time that Labour was actually a mass party with a really strong base, really strong links with the unions uh, in the post-war period, right? What did we get? We got the creation of an NHS in the face of astonishing levels of resistance from every area of the state, from the doctors, from, you know, businesses. It was a mass Labour Party that, because it was a mass party, was able to push through that resistance and deliver probably the biggest and most mm. important transformation in in our government mm. that has ever happened um certainly in the 20th century that was the creation of the nhs yeah. so you know I, I do think that there is a possibility for this model to work and historically we've seen that there are possibilities for this model to work um but and this is where i come back to the arguments in the book it requires people to build power from the ground up. There was a sense, I think, among those of us who are socialists that Corbynism was kind of a shortcut mm -hmm. to building power within society yeah. as a whole, and that didn't work. Uh, what do you think of Labour and Keir Starmer's position on Gaza? And does Gaza as an issue tie into the issues discussed in your book? I'm horrified by the Labour Party's position on Gaza. It was actually what led me to leave the party. Right. Um, it was after Keir Starmer um, a while ago said, I think it was on LBC, that uh, Israel had the right basically to commit war crimes by denying food to people within Gaza. Everything we've seen since then, I, I mean, I don't know about you, I've found it just difficult to sleep, difficult to watch, knowing that our government is sending weapons to this regime, sending resources to we're this not, regime. We're, we're, our, well, our, weapons our, that are being produced in the UK, it yeah, hasn't, yeah, sure. you know, yeah. yeah. Um, and sending resources to this regime and is on the side of this massive military industrial complex that spans the Atlantic, that is fueling Israeli power and being used to like rip the limbs off children in Palestine. I, 
think it is going to be the defining moral issue of our age. And, you know, I don't spend a lot of time talking about just issues that are just an issue of morality, mm. right? I spend a lot of time talking about economics, about building power, about kind of practical and strategic considerations. I consider this to be a defining moral failure for the Labour Party. And I will I don't think be able to forgive the politicians that are behind it. When um when the Iraq war was happening, I remember going on a lot of the the marches mm. then I wrote and I wrote a lot about that. I was quite very sort of junior journalist, young journalist at the time, but I wrote quite a lot about it. I remember going to the huge the, the biggest demonstration. Yeah, my mum was Hyde there. Park, like a million people there. Yeah. And uh you were at it and you walking through it, being in Hyde Park afterwards thinking this is this is enormous, this is massive, mm. this has got to change something. And then leaving it, because I had to file, I think I was writing for the Glasgow Herald, I had to go and file something, coming out onto Oxford Street, which was precisely as busy as it always yeah. was. And you suddenly thought, oh. And I wonder, I'm interested in what you think about this idea that, I mean, I, I, I wrote a column suggesting this last week, that politically speaking, Starmer has handled Gaza rather well because he has not, uh, he has not struck that moral position. And because actually there are a lot of people who don't want to hear that moral position, and had he struck that moral position, he would have been able to, to be attacked by people who take the opposite moral position, who do exist, and he would have got stuck in the mire that Jeremy Corbyn got stuck in. We know that there is huge, widespread support for a ceasefire. Um, and as this conflict has gone on... He's, he's supporting a ceasefire. Well, okay, he's supporting a whatever it is, humanity. Like, the yeah. wording has been different. It's yeah, deliberately it's, it, been created it to... It, yes. Yeah, whatever. Yes. You yeah. know, there were those of us that looked at the development of yeah. this and, and saw what has happened yeah. coming a long time ago and said, we need to stop this right now. And Keir Starmer demurred from doing that, allegedly in order to kind of preserve some sort of political capital. Firstly, you know, I just find that argument just com a complete... Um, just morally abhorrent, basically. Right. The idea sure. that you would put, like, preserving your political capital ahead of just what we are going to look back on as like potentially the source of the long-term shift where the west completely and utterly loses legitimacy but why, um why this i mean I'd have, I'd have thought iraq was that i'm not sure why i mean this well, yeah i mean anyway, iraq was yeah. certainly yeah, <laughs> certainly was, a, a step back, in the yeah. right direction um yeah i mean i suppose what's the difference here i think a big part of the difference is that we're seeing in real time videos being posted by but, Palestinians on social media but showing... Blair, but Blair was in Iraq. Starmer was just the opposition. You know, the the, the way that this has become his war, I find... I, I struggle with... Putting that I, one... Again, I think it is to do with the fact that, like, we are providing political cover for the Israeli state as well as facilitating the transfer of resources to the Israeli state. And let's bear in mind right now that the only thing that's allowing Israel to continue doing this yeah. is the political cover and resources that are being well, provided to it from from the US and the UK. I think in the UK we sell, I think it's like 50 million worth of arms to Israel out of an arms industry of 8 billion. I mean, we, we follow, sell... you know, blindly American policy on this and, yeah, and sure. the Americans are channeling vast sums of, to, of money into israel to go back to the the reason why we're do here, i think it's how, politically how, clever how, how, no, no, no 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 i mean never, never, mm. you've, you've explained that mm. how does it connect with does how does it and does it connect with the themes discussed in your book so yeah, there are ways of connecting it to the themes discussed in my book you know just like the levels of collusion between the private uh, private sector and the particularly the American state when it comes to the production of arms, what has been referred to as the military industrial complex, whereby these huge private companies um, become deeply enmeshed with the Department of Defense, the Pentagon. Um, they, you know, derive huge profits basically from American adventurism all over the but world, that's, that's, and then in turn lobby Israel's for. War, no, 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 it's no, not yeah, why. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's why I'm saying yeah. there are reasons right, that you sure, can sorry. you can link these two things together. It's basically about showing the way that private interests are able to profit from um, state policy, and and yeah. will continue to do that, and and the the very strong links that there are between the two. Um, when it comes to the arguments in the book, like as to why this war is happening, you know, there's no, there's never any uh, any way of kind of reducing contingent events directly to these more structural arguments. Yeah, okay, but like wise. the the context in which this is happening is a context within which the the U.S. state sees it as very important to have 
a an outpost, an ally in the Middle East, um, and that it has historically used that as a way to make sure that parts of the world that it would like to see remain open to international capitalism do remain open to international capitalism. That's not a causal argument. It's an argument for the context in wi within which this takes place and within which American imperialism takes place in general, which is that the US sees it as its role to maintain the freedom, in inverted commas, the freedom of international capital. Mm. Um, I'm interested in the inverted commas. Uh, because well, because freedom, you know, America says it goes into wars to preserve yeah. human freedom and it yeah. goes into wars to preserve the freedom of capitalists. Yes, although there are cases, particularly at the moment, if you look at Ukraine, where those are very much going hand in hand. Are they well, not? I mean, you know, the hypocrisy there is pretty, I think, striking for everyone to see when you have America going into Ukraine saying we are protecting human freedom at the same time as they're literally providing weapons to a government that's bombing children. And, you know, we also have alliances of convenience with horrendously authoritarian and illiberal states like Saudi Arabia. Sure. Yeah. So, sure. you know, this argument for freedom and democracy is, is kind of absurd. And I don't think anyone really buys it anymore, do they? But in Ukraine? Not even in Ukraine? Well, I mean, yeah, these arguments are pulled out in order to justify things that are already going to be in the interest of American foreign policy. But so... Right, but in... I mean, to focus on Ukraine... Sorry, and forgive me, forgive the tangent. Uh, it's in the interest of American f foreign policy because it's a war f for democratic freedom. Right? It's in I the interest of American not, foreign, foreign, not, foreign policy to, to, I mean, that, to oppose that, Russia. Irrelevant. It's like the geopolitical foundations of this are but like really, Russia is part of an enemy camp. So but that's these it. arguments, which are legitimate about like, you know, the Ukrainian crimes that Russia are committing. Ukrainian democracy versus autocracy. You, I mean, you're saying that's just something that's conveniently embraced by America. I'm saying that the people the making these arguments about mm. how America goes into wars to protect human freedom those arguments are only ever used when the um you know when the intervention is already in the u.s's interests right, right? sure yeah no I, i'm not saying that. that that's not true i'm not saying yeah. that you know no, you, you, that, yeah. like what's going on in ukraine isn't horrific and like you know that russia isn't crushing ukrainian democracy mm -hmm. what i'm saying is that there is this deep-seated hypocrisy i think you know it, it's clearest when it comes to like Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah. Like, there's been... I, I, I read an article the other day, actually, that there's been new evidence about this corrupt arms deal that the UK government did via the AE systems with the Saudis, the Al Yamama mm. deal, um, where massive bribes were paid. Saudi officials walked away with just, you know, all this all this cash, basically, and this was yeah. all done via BAE systems. Um, and yet we have officials going out there and saying, you know, providing weapons to this insanely mm -hmm. corrupt authoritarian um, regime yeah. that, you know, screws over its citizens. And we have the gall to go out and say that Britain stands up for, you know, freedom and democracy all over the world. We don't. We stand up for freedom and democracy when it's convenient to when us. It, when it suits us. I think that's, that's completely fair. I think we could far more... We'd sell far more weaponry to both Saudi Arabia and Qatar than we did than we do to Israel. No, I was, we do. I was, I was quite, yeah, of I was course. quite struck by how, how little we actually do sell to Israel. In fact, it's, it's very possible they actually sell more to us. But that's the same, I guess, trade, I suppose. Uh, I said I wanted to go back to environmentalism, um, which is more germanely uh, linked to the book. The um, How to put this? Is a grassroots politics that empowers individual people going to solve the climate crisis. I think or, it's the only thing that's going to solve the climate crisis. Is there not a real risk that when you, particularly when you localise, when you have small groups, people are not going to think about the big picture in that kind of way. People are going to think about, I mean, you, you see it at the moment, you see about the, the resentment, uh, the, uh, the cost of energy, mm. for example. Not that that's caused by climate policies. I get quite cross when people say it is caused by climate policies. But sure, there's a link. There's a reason why we don't have coal plants, for example. People, uh, so I'm not sure I have faith that small grassroots groups are going to be able to take big decisions on global issues like climate change. I'm interested to see how you'd, how you'd fix yeah, that. Yeah, sure. I'm not saying localism is the solution to all of our problems. I'm saying that local um, projects to kind of build power can be the foundation of a wider movement for political change. Yep. I'm saying that you don't get political change at a party level, at a national at a national level or an international level without that being rooted in, um, you know, communities, in uh, organised labour, in stuff that's actually able to project power at a local level. Um, and it's again, you know, coming back to that example of, of Nye Bevan and the creation of the NHS, yep. his power and authority was rooted in the fact that he had um, links with the labor movement and actually with um, these kind of health movement, uh, sorry, uh, friendly societies and like um, uh, institutions that provided health at the local level. 
um and that provided him with like the power and the incentive to push for these changes at mm -hmm. the national level so if you have politicians that are trying to really upset the status quo which is what um any project for kind of decarbonization is they need to have they need to be able to draw on a political project that can provide them with backing. That's kind of what I meant when I said, like, Corbynism was an attempt to do this yeah. shortcut that didn't work because there wasn't that grassroots power. You know, the labor movement wasn't strong enough. Community organizations weren't strong enough. But, there was an attempt to build that back, but it but didn't do you, work. Do you not fundamentally think they're just going to pull in different ways? I mean, you look what at, you you, well, you look at, um, look at Port Talbot, for example. Yeah. You know, a, 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 a grassroots local view there would mm. be keep our steel plant open. Yeah. Uh, a, a climate friendly net zero view would be hell no. And I don't see how you. What was fascinating was that when there was this attempt to push through this Green New Deal motion at Labour Party conference, th this exact thing came up. Mm -hmm. It was a big divide between certain unions, um, particularly those that had workers in, you know, the in, in pr the polluting sectors and the kind of you know what you would say like the green hippie yeah. young woke part of of uh, of the movement that were really pushing for this and this was set up as a big divide particularly in the press it was like these two different sides are never going to agree like this it is going to be the, the end of corbynism it was, and it, they, it was the leninists and the john leninists and that, that <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 which is you know what's going to have to happen um but you know they did ultimately manage to agree something because there was this sense that there was this collective of interest in um, building this coalition that would be able to transform society. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be easy, but that is what has has to happen. Because I mean, look at in the in the book, I look at the example of ExxonMobil, right? ExxonMobil knew about um, what was then called kind of the greenhouse effect, what its scientists called the greenhouse yeah, effect in the 1970s. Sure. It buried uh, that information, took all the funding out of its climate research team, put that into climate denialism, um, and used a lot of of its power to basically lobby the US state and lobby particular um, US senators to push back against any regulation on climate breakdown and actually to advocate for a carbon tax on the basis that they knew that was never mm -hmm. going to happen. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of links between these massive oil companies and the, the state that is supposed to be regulating them mean that if we don't have a source of countervailing power, we're not going to see any shifts. You know, Biden was elected on this platform that was all about climate breakdown. Yeah. Um, and then he comes in, he kind of does a couple of bits and pieces to try did, and make did, it... He did, he did quite a lot, he, he? Initially, yeah, yeah. He, did some, he did some stuff to try and make... Um, to, to, you know, he put through some of the policies that he'd campaigned yeah. on at the same time as expanding offshore drilling, continuing right. to provide massive mm -hmm. subsidies for the fossil fuel giants. And you look at that and you think, that's a bit of a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. It's like it shows very clearly the way the political power works because you have these different interests that are pulling on the exercise of state power, one of which is very powerful, which is mm -hmm. the fossil fuel lobby. And if you don't have another... A counterweight that yep. is able to build more strength than that, then these guys are going to win, even if politicians are saying we're going to do lots of lovely things to save the environment. But the problem is if that counterweight is pulling the same way as the fossil fuel industry rather than against it, which is, an, I think, a, a, a danger. Um, Brexit. <laughs> just, we're getting all no, the good topics no today. segue just just throw that out <laughs> no look i mean, I mean it, obviously it does link into all these themes yeah. of, of empowerment and change and uh, and and so on first up precisely where were you on brexit because i haven't quite been able to figure it out <laughs> you haven't been able to figure <laughs> it out um i voted to remain right um this was kind of before i was even really doing much within politics mm. um and then um basically changed my mind <laughs> after after the, after the um, vote yeah after the vote right. um and the reason for that was i started just reading more and looking more into like the nature of the european union mm -hmm. into like what had been a longer term labor tradition of opposition to the european yeah. union politicians like tony benn for example who were against the idea of the european union as this kind of capitalist club um and i basically saw that um firstly this divide was going to become just like impossible for mm -hmm. labor to be able to negotiate um, and I also saw that actually the kinds of politics and political solutions that I was advocating for at the time would be either impossible or very difficult to push through, um, you know, certain European laws on things yep. like state aid um, and also the kind of the politics of subsidiarity. So pulling power down to the local level. Again, that's something that institutions like the European Union really work against. Um, and for all of those reasons, I thought it was really, really important to try, try and make a progressive case for leaving. Um, I think, you know, 
with big political events like Brexit, um, it, it's what happens immediately after that is a battle to define what the thing is. Um, and there's this sense that Brexit is a thing and it will happen in a particular way and you project your ideas as to what that thing is mm -hmm. and how it's going to happen onto it based on your position in the political spectrum. But the real battle over Brexit was a battle to define what it was. And I think if the, le the left had stepped up a bit more to define what it was, to say this is about democracy, to say this is about kind of, you know, making sure that ordinary people have power over their lives, then it wouldn't have ended up in the kind of quagmire that it did. Right, so you don't think it was inevitable that we ended up where we are no. post-Brexit? Post no, nothing's right. inevitable in politics, is it? Right, okay, sure. Um, we're nearly done, I promise. Uh, um, you began your career working for KPMG. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but... Um, I haven't first, been grilled first, like this in such a long time. I feel first like one this is, is why preparation for uh, <laughs> I, 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 politics. It, it's not a it's not a hostile um, question. Why? What, what, no, no. What, why and what did you get out of it? Yeah, um, and how, no, and it's, how, it's, and how it's does a it lead to the, to, to the views question. you now have? Yeah, um, so I left university and started working for a think tank. Um, yeah. And then that think tank did some work with KPMG. Mm -hmm. And one of the partners there was like, do you want to come work for yeah. me? Um, and I was like, okay, this could be great because they were developing, it was the consulting team for the public yeah. sector. And little naive me was like, oh, great, you know, we'll go and work with local authorities and help mm -hmm. them to, it was particularly designing um, public services that were more integrated. Sure. So like the idea yeah. that when, well, you know, very yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah. like, you know, yeah. I thought it was really interesting. Um, so I arrived and I was like, I've got all my knowledge, like I'm gonna kind of help to design some really interesting um, solutions to these problems. I quickly found out that firstly, I was not very good at being a consultant. I really enjoyed the process of like, researching all of the problems and delivering mm -hmm. this like really long report for the partners who could then say, oh, look at all the things that we know about like, you know, complex complex needs and mm -hmm. how those can be solved by kind of integrated public services. Um, but that wasn't particularly useful because it didn't really make anyone any money. I wasn't very good at selling. I wasn't very good at, I mean, I've got ADHD, so I was appallingly organized. I used to just like forget my meetings and mm -hmm. I was not going anywhere, basically. I realized that and I think everyone else realized <laughs> that. And my manager at KPMG, who's still a very good friend of mine, um, was kind of like, you know, what's going on here <laughs> like what like where next for you and i realized that um it, you know i wasn't going anywhere so i then managed to uh, get a job at ippr north in manchester mm -hmm. went back to think tank world um and did the writing long reports um full time were your politics very different from the people you were working with or do firms like this actually have a huge bunch of borderline revolutionary socialists and we just don't they know. do really yeah really? i remember actually doing some work with a partner at a law firm um i can't actually i think this might have been in one of the think tanks um and him being like i, I was a, a revolutionary socialist back in the 60s mm. or something and he was very kind of like on on brand uh, i think you'll find a lot of people like that you know my parents are kind of like that well my dad's kind of like that you know they were really um, lefties and they were all involved in the Nicaragua Solidarity campaign and then went into the corporate world. My dad did, my mum became an academic, but they still, you know, cheer me on from the sidelines and they're like, I think things need to change. Mm. I see all this corruption mm. all the time. I think a lot of people are kind of broadly speaking, they feel like trapped by systems over which they feel like they don't have very much control and that they would like to see changed, um, but they don't really know where to begin. Um, I guess my last question is what does success look like for you? I don't mean personally or professionally, because I think you're probably living that at the moment. <laughs> but I mean, politically, um, what, what would you like to see happen? And what if it doesn't happen means that the arguments you've made and the manner in which you've advanced them, you should have done something different? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I completely see what you if mean. If we're it's... still in the same boat in 20 years time, yeah. and people haven't, which would mean people haven't been listening to you. Yeah. What will you think you maybe should have done differently? Um, I don't have like a thing that I want to see happen because politics, as as we've you know discussed, it can go so many different directions. Mm. And I'm kind of involved in political movements like taking place all over the world. You know, I'm not just- But it's important they succeed, right? It is you know, important you, they you, succeed. You're, you're, you're not a hobbyist. You're, you're, no, 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 you're, but you're this an, is activist, the, right? the so. point that I'm, that I'm getting to is I ask myself this question a lot, right? It's like, what do you want? Like, why are you doing this? Because mm. like, you can say I'm being personally successful. Sure, I would, in a lot of ways, potentially rather just be sat 
where I live in Cornwall writing books and surfing. Like the reason that I continue to put myself in situations like this is because I want to change the way that people think about the world, change the way they think about themselves and change the way they think about their relationships to other people. Now that is quite broad and diffuse, yeah. but like I get messages from people who say, reading your book changed the way I think. And that is for me what I want. I don't want necessarily, you know, to look back in... 50 years and think, oh, my work was integral to the revolution because <laughs> firstly, you're never going to know that. And secondly, yeah. like, it's it's absurd. What I want to be able to look back and think is that, like, I helped people see the system and see how they could change it and maybe gave one or two people who did something cool the sense of their own, you know, their own power and their own ability to, to transform the world. I think that's a wonderful thing to want. Um, <laughs> the book is uh, Vulture Capitalism, Corporate, Cri Corporate Crimes, Backdoor Bailouts and the Death of Freedom. Thank you very much, Chris Blakely. Thank you.